Welcome to the Sustainable Clinical Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Sarah Smith. I am a practicing rural family physician and the charting coach. This is the podcast for physicians and advanced practice providers who are ready to step back from the busyness of their clinical day to share ideas, question everything, and redesign their clinical day. We are redesigning clinical medicine to create sustainable clinical days and create time for our lives outside of medicine. Join us for discussions with world experts who are helping design sustainable models of clinical medicine and the physicians or clinicians who have discovered or designed sustainable models of clinical medicine for themselves. Hello and welcome back everybody. So today we have Dr. Kevin Milo who is coming to us to talk about sustainable clinical medicine his way and how we can flourish in our personal and professional lives. I will let you introduce yourself. Welcome. Hi. uh, Thanks so much for having me uh, here, Sarah, today. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very, very glad to be here. Um, I know we've had you um, on our podcast um, and that was a very well-received episode. And I absolutely love uh, the message and teaching that you offer uh, through the charting coach. So I I am a full time emergency physician um, uh, based out of uh, Short Park, just east of Edmonton. I do a little bit of family practice, and I'm one of the co founders of Physician Empowerment. Uh, and do you want me to go through and say a little bit about our our story or my story? And yeah, absolutely. And how I got Please here. Do. Keep going. And yes. okay, let me keep going. So um, yeah, I started Physician Empowerment essentially in 2016, um, where we had begun um, doing live events for Canadian physicians, uh, mostly those in practice. Um, we've since expanded to include learners as well, uh, where we talk about financial topics um, that are relevant to doctors, the things that nobody talked about um, years ago. Thankfully, within the profession, we are having many more conversations um, along these lines. And I think it's so important because the landscape has changed so dramatically for physicians in the last 10 years. And, you know, what I'm referring to is um, changes at the federal level to taxation of professional corporations, um, rising overhead, rising cost of living, fees that aren't keeping up, um, and burnout in general. Uh, that has really, I think, since the pandemic caused a lot of us uh, to reevaluate our practices and our lives. And my own journey is a lot more personal, though, than that. Um, so actually, it's funny, I know you're based out of Edson, um, Alberta, but I, I did some of my clerkship there. I, I lived there for nine okay. months. Um, wow. And, um, That's so fun. Uh, you know, my uh, former wife and I both trained there is during medical school and you know, uh, we had two kids at the time and eventually had four and it was an incredible experience, uh, living and working in Edson. Um, and med school was a ton of fun. Residency was a ton of fun. Uh, we did it with kids, but it was a wild ride financially, uh, because we, had, you know, had lived in different provinces at different times over those training years. Um, we had to pay a lot of money for childcare. I remember the nanny hitting overtime by like Wednesday afternoons. And I think that year she earned more than I did in residency. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I remember watching the, the debt pile up throughout my med school and residency days. And it got to the point that finance became the biggest fear that I had going through, you know, medical school and residency as a learner, like it it started to sit at the front of my mind in a way that my rotations, um, training, career path, jobs, all of that was secondary to just this constant worry about this ever growing debt. And then how do I pay it off? And then a whole flood of questions about what do I do afterwards? Realizing that for the vast majority of us, we are truly self-employed. Uh, we have an hourly wage. If we don't go into work, we don't earn. And we don't get any, there's no parental leave. There's no sick leave. There's no paid vacation. Mm -hmm. There's no retirement pension. There's none of these things. We don't even have benefits. And, And that really crystallized my thinking around finance that, yes, I guess the number that we earn, you know, the gross income can be high, 
but there are a lot of other costs we just don't account for. And this really got me thinking um, throughout my my years as a learner and my first two years of practice. And I remember going to colleagues, um, you know, who were years, sometimes decades older than me, and they just sort of would shrug and say, oh, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. But that was kind of cold comfort as I was struggling with all of these loans, all of these questions, you know, wondering when, when are we going to get on our feet? You know, like at what point do we get a mortgage? How much mortgage can we afford? How, when do I start saving for retirement? How do I do it? Hmm. Um, and thankfully, you know, I had made a couple of right decisions along the way. I actually incorporated before my first day of practice. And I remember getting laughed at about that one um, by a lot of colleagues and things, but at that time you could income split Um you know, and so there were opportunities to use dividends um, to move money out of the corporation quite effectively. And so my accountant was all over that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know, shortly after ending practice, set up a holding corporation, and began buying real estate, mm -hmm. um, which I, you know, has been a, a an absolute, it's more than, more than financial security. That to me, my small real estate portfolio represents peace of mind and optimism about the future. Um, because it represents income outside of my clinical earnings. Because again, going back to that point, like, you know, we, we all need to be able to go into work and, and earn because those bills don't stop coming in, especially those of us um, who have overhead and practices, right. Um, who are not strictly hospital-based or academic physicians. And so, so, you know, you have to be mindful of those things, uh, you know, even, even, you know, snowboarding with the kids I gave that up or you know I won't hop on my skates anymore um because I don't want to wipe out and get a wrist injury and be off work you know so it's all those kind of things that play in your head yeah and I you know Sarah I went through so many years wondering about money and then I started to learn I started to read and then I started to teach it mm -hmm. and I realized that these conversations I was having with residents or staff that were newer in practice than I was, I used to call them like the $100,000 coffees or the $100,000 lunches because I would go through billings and, you know, taxation and why you should be incorporated. Every physician, in my opinion, should be incorporated. And I can explain that later if anybody ever wants to know, or you can hop on our podcast and see, get a glimpse of that. But, you know, I realized that there's a lot of value here to the profession when we, when we teach finance and we teach it properly. Um, and so that's when, you know, we started our first conference in 2016. It was extremely well received. Um, you know, I remember people in the audience crying that year because of some of the things we had been talking about on a very personal level, right. You know, hitting those pain points, the things that people don't want to talk about mm -hmm. struggling with personal debts, too much mortgage. Uh, and, and so, we just never looked back after that. And it's been an absolutely incredible, incredible uh, journey. And we continue to hold a national conference every year in Toronto. But what I'm really proud about is the small groups um, that we host every month. Um, it's a masterclass and we get together as a community. And that's where I feel so proud of what we built because it's far more than education. It is truly community. Um, the people that have been with us for years and years or since the beginning, um, they don't feel like colleagues um, or friends. Some of them actually feel like family. And it's such a beautiful thing because it's not, um, you know, my partner Wing and I, he, he's, I, I didn't mention him, but he's um, an absolute genius at practice building and has done very well in in real estate and finance. But, um, you know, it's it's actually, it's the, the real magic is watching fellow masterclass enrollees support one another in building practices or, you know, giving advice. And then I feel like I learn more than I teach at this stage um, because of how enriched the environment is. So, so that's, that's it for me uh, with physician empowerment. And, and it's just so exciting to be a part of something bigger than yourself and to start to create that sense of community where you don't feel alone mm -hmm. dealing with these financial struggles that we all face, everybody faces them in, and, and it's hard sometimes to talk about, about it, but it's really amazing um, when we can come together and speak very frankly. And then more importantly, not just kvetch or going on, on and on about problems, but, but really talk about solutions 
and feel good about our financial future. Yeah. So you said you had gone to the mentors older, much older than you and the you'll be fine attitude. Did you did you kind of sit them down and say, okay, tell me how it's going to be fine? Or did you kind of get really Yeah, yeah, I would push. I would push a little bit. I would push a little bit. But it was interesting because you realize, especially back then, people really didn't know in the profession, if I can be perfectly blunt. And I talked to a lot of people. You know, some people would say, oh, I don't know, I've got a financial planner, they handle it, or I give my money to this person and they're great with it, or, you know, my spouse handles it. Um, But I think we need to be a little more hands-on than that. And I I really love what what my partner Wing describes. He says, um, he, you know, you got to manage your managers. I don't think that physicians should be doing their own taxes because they don't want to pay an accountant, which that's out there, that happens. I don't think physicians should be doing their own bookkeeping. That should be delegated. Um, I see physicians that, you know, you know, trade and do all of their own trading. Um, I think whether you are successful in that or not is missing the point. The point is like, as you work your 70 hour work week and you try to have a family life and you try to maintain healthy habits, do you really want to log in to your trading account at 10 o'clock at night and start making trades and try to analyze the market? I don't (laughs) No. (laughs) Right. Like when we talk about sustainable practice, you know, a key element here is the notion that you are the most important investment in your life. You are your own rate limiting step. There is only one of you. And, and you need to, you need to be productive. You need to be efficient, but I don't like those words, Sarah. Um, you need to be happier. You need to be thriving. You need to be enjoying your job. You need to be doing great medicine. You need to be healthy and happy. And then you need to feel financial security in a way that you're not having to micromanage it. And that's where I think it's so important to build a team and to learn to let go, right? I mean, you know, I'm a generalist and I consult. We all do that. So why wouldn't we do that in our financial lives? So, So again, you know, you ask yourself, like, is this worth it? to take precious time in my week to micromanage my, my finances. And so, yeah, that's sort of my, my reflection on, on some of those issues. And as physicians, I, I think we are very hands-on and I get that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I always use this example, but I don't want the surgeon like sewing up my bowel kind of shrugging going, ah, good enough. I want them to check and then check again. I want them to be meticulous. Right. Um, I get that. But then there are parts where we should delegate. We do it in our office practices. We do it in the hospital. And that's what makes us more effective, right? When our energies are focused. Yeah. Into that area of zone of genius. Keep our energy where it needs to be. Yeah. And delegate the things that we could do, but we don't have to. Exactly. And I think that really speaks to the heart of what you, you talk about too, in terms of practice efficiency. Yeah. Go back to when you were struggling with that finance piece. Four small children. I can't even snowboard because if I break a wrist, everything's going to fall apart. Yeah. So what does that feel like? How does that impact you in your personal day to day? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's really, you know, it really crystallizes it, and and you realize how key you are um to the viability of your success in your financial life um and it's you know not just you it's the patients that depend on you it's the colleagues that depend on you you don't want to be the one that has to dump a bunch of uh shifts or call or clinic um because of a you know a health issue and things and i actually think that's wrong right i think we need much more margin within the profession much more redundancy effective systems have redundancy right? We should be overstaffed, not understaffed and, and overworked, right? Um, We should all have that flexibility, but we don't, right? And that's a system level issue. Mm -hmm. But within that, yeah, it, it's a struggle. And I think, 
what I find really heartbreaking is I've seen a number of physician colleagues who have gotten major illnesses and couldn't afford to slow down. Mm. And that's the really heartbreaking one. And when I think about financial security, it is not about what you buy, right? When, when, you know, when we found a physician empowerment, this wasn't about helping doctors reach a certain number or net worth or buy certain things, have a certain size house, you know, even retire at a certain age. This was about building better lives. This is about allowing physicians to feel secure in their financial lives, know that they are going to be prosperous, know that they're going to be financially stable, not only now, but also in retirement, but also when, when life, well, frankly, when life throws you a curveball and you get faced with a major illness or something else in your personal life, and you have that financial margin to be comfortable with it, right? And that your finance shouldn't be a struggle. And so that's where I really think finance needs to be discussed in that space of your wellness or your well-being. Yeah, that's another thing we teach. Um, we actually do accredited wellness CME. Um, and that's probably one of the parts I'm most proud of as physician empowerment has grown is that we actually get to discuss wellness. We were in Mexico doing it not too long ago and, and we're off to the Galapagos in April, um, to, to some of which will be a discussion around wellness, but you need, in order to practice that wellness, you need to have financial margin, right? You, you know, like if, if your happy number of hours in a week is 40, then you can't be working 70. Yeah. Yeah. You like, you can do all of the journaling, all of the yoga, all of the meditation, all of the, whatever it is you, you think you need to be doing right. All the extra, but the biggest thing is probably doing less. That's when I talk about wellness. I say there are doing more things, right. Which mm -hmm. is more of exercise, more of sleep, more of family time, more of personal time, more leisure reading, whatever more things, but more always takes time. Mm. And where are you going to get that time from? Because the vast majority of your waking hours in a given week, go to your clinical practice. So again, it, everyone's got a different number of hours where they're happiest, right? Because I know we all love our jobs or the vast majority of us do. No, I don't think anybody wants to work like no hours in a week, but there also comes a point where, yeah, I love it. But, you know, I don't want to work it 80 hours a week. You know, it's like ice cream. Yeah, I get it. It's delicious, but not by the pail full, you know. Uh, when you were, and, um, back in the yeah. early days, just because Canada yeah. and the US and the Australia systems are yeah. all different. Is it per hour or is it a salary? Like what are the, what, are, what were you set up for in those first few years as a resident? Well, as a resident, you're salaried. Okay. Um you know, but yeah, I mean, as a resident, you're salaried. And then as a staff person, I mean, we're all compensated, you know, differently. There's blended models, you know, like mm -hmm. blended capitation. Uh, there are, you know, fee for service models. There are purely salaried models, but fundamentally we all have an hourly rate. We all trade time for money. And you can, you can actually calculate that very easily. And I, it's something I teach, but I mean, the calculation is pretty simple. You know, it's how many hours a week are you in front of patients? How many hours a week? And then you add to that the number of hours a week you spend doing administrative tasks. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about charting, um, <laughs> but all of the meetings, phone calls, mm -hmm. time with your accountant, sorting out your professional corporation. And then even your, even your commute, right? Mm -hmm. If you have an ugly commute, that should count. If you have a wonderful commute and it's a bike ride or a, you know, a nice drive through the country or whatever, you know, you're happy with, um, then don't count that part, but you need to know your hourly rate. Um, because fundamentally, regardless of how you are remunerated, you have an hourly rate and it's important to, to grasp it because it really allows you to delegate or to, um, outsource tasks in your personal and professional life, which again is part of sustainable clinical practice, right? Finding, you know, what can, what is, what is it that is, I can only do, mm. right. And then what can be delegated out 
to other people in my life. And you can delegate within your financial life. So finding an excellent financial planner, portfolio manager, accountant, bookkeeper, tax lawyer. In your professional life, I mean, it's medical office assistants who are well-trained, right? You know, reception staff that, you know, know your workflow, right? Or, you know, entrusting your your learners if they're well-trained, right? Or your colleagues, trusting them to manage while you're gone um, on vacation. You know, those things go a long way in aggregate, right? No one thing is going to transform your life, but if you get in the habit of that effective delegation Mm -hmm. and trusting, you know, the team you're building around you, it can be incredibly powerful. It can be incredibly liberating because then you get to just do the parts of the job that are so enjoyable and so crucial while the, the less enjoyable parts, especially the administrative stuff lightens. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah. Um, And, and, I think that allows us to stay in the game longer. And I'm not talking more hours in a week. I'm talking, I you keep, I keep ranting about that. You know, you, I keep going on and on about that, but it's about really being able to like practice for a long, long time. If that's what you want without burning out, like truly loving your job. And if you want to go beyond standard retirement age of 65, because you're healthy you know, because you slept well the last 30 years, because you continue to exercise, you know, because you haven't overworked, then you can keep going and do it for the love of the job and teach younger generations, right? More importantly, it's even an opportunity to transform the system, right? I mean, I touched on system level issues. Mm. But for those of us who are passionate about transforming our healthcare system, not only for the benefit of doctors, but for the benefit of patients, that takes involvement. That takes time. Where are you going to get that time from if you are working 70 hours a week, 80 hours a week? More importantly, and again, this is why I teach finance, it costs money. If you give up a half day of clinic every week to sit on a committee or to volunteer your time, you know there's a cost to that. There's a very fixed dollar amount. And it's not just lost earnings, it's the overhead you're stuck paying while you're not there. Right. And so that's the thing I try to reflect on. Right. And this is where financial security plays a role in not only allowing us to, pl- to practice better bedside medicine and to be happier in our day to day, but to truly make change and transform the system we work in. Because that's a key element of burnout. I, I study, you know, burnout fairly extensively and I've, you know, I speak about it and I teach it, but a key element of burnout is a feeling of powerlessness. When you are in a work environment where you feel you have no voice, no control, where you feel irrelevant or replaceable. But if you, you know, reach that point of becoming financially secure and can get involved and speak up, you start to feel better about the work environment that you're in. You start to feel like you have a voice at the table. And I think that's very powerful. And I, and that's, again, one of the dreams that I have with physician empowerment is not just that, you know, Canadian doctors um, enjoy, you know, healthier practices and healthier personal lives, but that we can actually get more involved when we free up more time to do that, which again, yeah. I think is, I think is really powerful. Yeah. I remember back in that place of overwhelm where all of the clinical day is taking up like every free second and just the next ask, it just feels too much. And so you feel like you've got zero ability to get to that place of helping change a system when you feel like you're just running on empty all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it gets that point. And I know what that, feels like because I used to feel that too is like you just dread the next ask because you're like I I don't even I don't even have the bandwidth to listen anymore yeah. let alone think it through yeah and then act on it yeah right it, it can feel overwhelming yeah overwhelming and then things like anger you're like why me why does it have to be me to fix this yeah you feel irritable right and this is this comes back to that notion of margin Mm-hmm. creating margin and redundancy in our lives. 
That is so, so key to sustainable clinical practice. Just having a little bit of breathing space in your day, in your week, in your month, in your year. Mm -hmm. What were some of the early things that you put in for breathing space? What do you think that would look like from you, from your point of view? Yeah. Um, So I think it started for me with a core sense of self and and self-care. And this is something I challenge um, our physician empowerment clients on continually. And and you'll hear it on my podcast. I, I go on and on about it. But if you were your own patient, what would you be telling yourself? You would probably say work fewer hours. You would say sleep more, yeah. exercise more, eat better, spend time with your family, spend time with yourself, have leisure, have hobbies. And so you start with what you need and then you, you work backwards to build around that, in my opinion. And, and you say, here are the things that I need for me in a given day, in a given week, in order to be happy and healthy and thriving. And that's going to be different for every one of us. Mm -hmm. That's one of the benefits of the masterclass that we teach is like, it's actually your process. It's you asking the hard questions of yourself, right? And you going through that self-exploration to find out what you need personally, professionally, and financially to achieve that. And once you have that, that strong sense of core self, and your core priorities for you, not other people, not what's mm-hmm. best for my group that I'm a, you know, an associate of, or what's best for you, not even what's best for my spouse or my children. It's what, or not what's best for the hospital or the system. It's like, what do I actually need? Right. That old adage of don't put somebody else's oxygen mask on when the plane is going down until you have your own on mm-hmm. be the best you you can be, and then let that light shine. And so that's where I really start. um, And where I typically advise, um, advise our our clients to start at as well. It's just Mm -hmm. take time and connect with yourself and find out what you really need to be happy, even write it down, I write it down. What does what does the best version of me look like and feel like? Right? I remember as a uh, emergency department resident, this is just before I went into my general practice training, um, it felt like <laughs> the world was sleep, feed babies, and go to work, right? Because I have a stay-at-home husband, so that was awesome because that helped to kind yeah. of offload some of the home duty stuff. But um, what did I need back then was mum's group and a community of other physician moms to kind of catch up with once a week was so helpful to feel like you had a life outside of medicine. Just that little glimmer of, Oh, I'm also a person. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So helpful to just kind of grab onto what do I need? And so that purposeful seeking of people, hobby interests, things that you've given up. And we talk about the cost of medicine, right? What is medicine costing you right now? And right now, if because the the listeners here are like, but I'm right there where I've got nothing. I've got work and sleep. <laughs> and and the other challenge that I went through, and I remember hitting this somewhere in the first five years of practice, you know, struggling with burnout, struggling with the shift work. And I asked myself, if I'm not happy now, when am I going to be happy? Mm. Right. Like we always, you know, we are so into this delayed gratification, right? Like the whole profession is selected for delayed gratification since our teenage years. (laughs) And so we keep saying, oh, well, it'll get better once I'm in my second decade of practice or once I've got the mortgage paid off or once my kids are older or once I retire, once I, once I, once I. And the truth is it has to start now. It doesn't have to change all at once but it has to start now. And that's where I started making a bunch of small changes in my personal, professional and financial life that over the period of years was absolutely transformative. Mm. That's, that's again, it starts now challenge yourself now, right? I mean, it's no different than your patient that you're counseling when they're like, Oh, I'm going to quit smoking next decade. 
no, I, you know, the sooner, the better, right? And there are no guarantees. We're reminded of that constantly in the profession. We don't know how long we have here on this earth and what, what the health, what our health will look like. So invest in being happy and vibrant and healthy now is my view. And then the other kind of key concept that I like to teach when I talk about sustainability, Sarah, is the notion of three selves. That in our lives, as a, you know, like you, if you look in the mirror, there are actually three versions of you. There is your, your career. There is the MD. Mm -hmm. There is you personally, including your inner child, um, you know, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your desires, your needs. And then there's your financial self, you know, or as wing calls it the black suit, white coat, black suit, right? And ideally what you're striving for is an alignment of all of those things, right? So you can't say, I want to run a marathon, but I have a spending problem and therefore have to work 90 hours a week. And by the way, I want to travel, you know, all over the world and take lots of time off for that. Those don't align, mm -hmm. right? So you need to say, okay, what is truly important to me? And then start lining things up accordingly, right? Across the three selves right? You're trying to create a unified whole here, right? Because if, yeah, like if, if that is your dream, you know, to go run a marathon and travel all over the, the world one year, then your practice decisions and your financial decisions need to align with that, right? And, and so again, it's, it's that taking time to connect with self. But the, the thing is, Sarah, is that we're often so busy so overworked that in a given day, we didn't have time to think about thinking, you know what I mean? To think about the big picture. Yeah. And that's what I find so challenging. Even for myself, I still have days when I'm so busy. I'm like, I was supposed to meditate for 15 minutes today. And that didn't happen. And I don't want to, I don't beat myself up anymore mm -hmm. because that just adds to the, the suffering. Um, don't. But it's an opportunity to say, I missed the mark today. I was supposed to, I was supposed to make it to the gym and I didn't, you know, I was supposed to stay off my phone after six tonight and I didn't right? like holding yourself accountable, but in a gentle and loving way mm -hmm. and understanding that change takes time. Right. But I think it, I think it's important that it's a constant process. You know, I don't describe myself as like, a younger version and an older version of myself, I describe myself as newer. As I go through the years of my life, the newer Kevin is healthier, happier, and a little bit wiser, just a little bit. Um, but again, it's creating that space. And one small tip that I, you know, I leave, you know, with anybody listening to this is just try driving without anything on the radio, right? Like try driving in silence to and from work. Try not getting out of your car to go into the office or the hospital for five minutes. Try not getting out of your car as soon as you pull into the driveway for five minutes. Start creating those tiny spaces to just go, oh, was this a good day? Was this a bad day? Was this a little bit of both? Am I happy? Right? Those small moments become the impetus for change because again it's it's about finding our own needs but we don't even know it sometimes we are so busy and we are so our our cameras our life our lenses are focused on the outside world all of the obligations we have to our hospital to our clinic to our patients to our colleagues to our families to our spouses and we are conscientious. That's another thing we're strongly selected for is conscientiousness, right? But the best version of you that all of those outsiders get needs to start with, you know, that self-healing and that self-care. Mm. And, and so again, it's take a moment to just turn and look inward and 
just connect with yourself. And it doesn't have to be anything big or dramatic. Like, Oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go drive to the, the mountains and, you know, do a retreat and, you know, go hiking on my own for three days and, and discover my purpose. Right. I mean, I hope we can all do that. I've never done it, even though I keep telling myself I'm going to, <laughs> right. I'm not, I'm not perfect here, <laughs> not by any stretch. Right. But it's, 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 it's starting that conversation with ourselves, which I think is so important. Mm. I think that sometimes we get a little frightened about those moments in silence that what we'll find. And I, I like your that um, advice about uh, just let it be small so it doesn't feel like a mammoth task. Don't worry if it all feels negative to start with. Like you're like you may just have a list of like your brain is programmed to say you know if this was a bad day, everything's going wrong. I hate this. I dread it. But then ask start asking questions so as we get let our brain ask a question like what else about this day what was good about this day like just asking a question can help your brain start looking for those answers too so we're so good at repeating what we say to others and to ourselves that whine and frustration and irritation and dread and the system's broken and this was bad and i'm overworked and then they're looking at what else what is it about this drive that we're enjoying? What is it about this day that we can enjoy? What did go well? What did I do well? Where did I show up better than I expected? Like all those little other side of the story conversation can really just start to move you a little bit forward. Or what is it that I do want? Because we haven't asked ourselves that in a long time. Sometimes. Yeah, like honestly, <laughs> what is it that I actually want in yeah. life or in my career? The other, I think one that is very powerful, um, and it's something I've done myself is whether you go see a coach or a therapist, there's something very powerful in having that dedicated time every week or every month where you check in with somebody who's a little bit more objective. Cause the problem is like spouses, family, friends, colleagues, everybody has a relationship with you. And, and there's need, there is that mutual dependency, right, which isn't a bad thing. But it's nice to check in with somebody who's a little more objective, like you don't have to go to therapy, because something's wrong. Yes. You can go to therapy, because you want things better. Mm -hmm. And, and it's powerful to speak it, I think it's powerful to hear your own voice. And then it's somebody that holds you accountable. You know, mm -hmm. I retrained as a family doctor um, this year, and I'm very proud of it. Um, and it gave me a ton of respect for the specialty, um, because I forgot how hard it is. <laughs> and I remember one of my my preceptors sitting down with a patient, and he was very honest. He's like, you know, he explained, he introduced us, and he says, she and I have been having this same conversation for about 15 years. And it was quite blunt. Um, and it was about something in, in the patient's personal life that she was struggling with. And it's that accountability, right? It's somebody that says, like, you said you were going to be working less within six months, but it sounds like you're working more. You know, you said you were going to, you know, um, start going to the gym more, whatever it is, right? Those things that you want, right? Or even just before you even get to that point talking about it so you can find out what you want find out what you don't want in a given week or a given month and say okay so what can i do to eliminate that side to it you know i work far fewer night shifts than i used to because i realized that i love emergency medicine i love it what i struggled with was the night shifts yeah so i work fewer of them and i fell back in love with my job and 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 it wasn't until like i did some like self-reflection that I, that I was, was able to connect with myself and say, well, no, this is what I need. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, we, rural family physician. So we do emergency medicine as well. And like when you're down colleagues, you're kind of picking up a few extra night shifts without, you know, desire to. <laughs> so it's that taking that moment and saying, okay, I'm going to be doing more night shifts. 
how do I look after myself knowing that I don't enjoy this and I feel like awful the next day? Let's schedule nothing the next day. Let's just make sure that day is actually a day of rest so that if we feel good, bonus time, but if we don't, that's okay because we haven't actually pushed ourselves to do additional things on the day after Uh, because I I agree with you. I think that the the night shift is a big ask physiology-wise, right? It's not natural. It's not natural. (laughs) It's not natural. I mean, I, I don't know. I... You know, I read a lot, I think a lot, you know, but humans evolved at the equator with no street lights or LEDs or, you know, anything more than a fire in the cave, you know? And so this notion of like, oh, I can be up or I can be on my phone till 11 o'clock at night is it, it does not align with our physiology right? Like we were supposed to close our eyes basically around dusk or (laughs) shortly thereafter. And we've been doing it for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's only in the last hundred years that now we feel like we have to be on and don't get me wrong. I mean, we need to cover hospitals around the clock. That's part of it, but it's what can I do to mitigate that? Mm -hmm. Is it working fewer shifts? Is it buddying? Mm -hmm. You know, is it having nothing scheduled the next day so that I'm not dreading? Because I know, you know, people who will do a night shift and then walk right into clinic, Mm -hmm. you know, with the scant three hours of sleep. The other key thing that stands out, and you mentioned it, is boundaries. This is so important. We are not responsible for system level failures. We are not responsible for system level failures. That rests with leadership. That rests with politicians. That is a much bigger discussion than one person giving up a weekend with their spouse and children to go and cover because there's a shortage. Mm-hmm. It took me a lot of years to learn that. Um, but that's some wisdom I wanted to share. And I feel very passionately about that. In fact, if you want the system to get better, get involved formally. Yeah. Right. Whether that means sitting on a committee, taking a leadership role, going into politics, whatever, that's how the system gets better. Not you giving up another weekend and jeopardizing your marriage, right. Or your relationship with your children boundaries. And the hardest boundary is not actually the one where we feel obligations to external parties, right? Whether it's, you know, hospital colleagues, patients that are demanding, it's actually the internal boundaries, Mm -hmm. giving yourself permission to say no, and feeling not okay with it, but good about it. Very hard to do. I still struggle with it. But it's a conversation we need to have within the profession is the notion of boundaries, because at some point, working in a broken system, and just constantly doing a band-aid solution as actually enabling the dysfunction, not reforming it, not improving it. And that's a very blunt sharing on my part, but I feel strongly about that. Yeah. I think we're hearing more and more in the same manner to say, look after you too, because if we look after ourselves, we can look after others. If we're not looking after ourselves, we're no good to anybody, uh, including ourselves. So important. Thank you. Yeah. How can people find you? Oh yeah, you can you can look me up. Um, <laughs> uh, up. <laughs> yeah, so you can you can go to physempowerment.ca or physicianempowerment.ca. Um, we've got a podcast uh, that's available on all of the podcast platforms. Um, you're on there, Sarah, and um, and then if you go if you go to the website, you actually find my personal information, so my personal cell phone and um, my personal email, and it's because. I really, really value the relationships um, that we have at Physician Empowerment. Like I said, like this has been such an incredible journey, not only in like building the project, but actually for myself, it's been so personally transformative. And it's been personally transformative, not for what I teach, but for what I've learned. And the wisdom of some of our, our colleagues and members is incredible. It's a truly a beautiful community. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I don't know, this is a part of me, my happiness, if you will, and a part of my own 
sustainable clinical medicine is having this sense of higher, higher um, purpose in, in, in my career is, is playing this role as, as an educator. So yes, you can, you can find us on the podcast. Uh, you can go to physicianempowerment.ca or phys, P-H-Y-S, empowerment.ca and um, connect with us that way. Perfect. And anything we didn't talk about that you wanted to share today? Anything I did? Oh, there's so much. It. There's so much I could go on and on about. Uh, <laughs> but no, this was an incredible conversation, Sarah. I, I absolutely loved it. Uh, no, there's nothing, there's nothing more I'd add. Awesome. Okay. So you, everybody take yourself a few minutes of quiet driving where possible. Once the kids are dropped off. <laughs> yeah. It's not normally I love that. Kids in the car. Um, and just start thinking about what is it that you need to, I love this. Thank you so much, Dr. Milo, for being here with us today. Have a great Thank you. week, everybody. I was really happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you for being part of the Sustainable Clinical Medicine Podcast. If you'd like to learn more or join us to help you get home with today's work done, go to chartingcoach.ca. There you'll find all the information on the premier lifetime access charting champions program that is helping physicians get home with today's work done with all the proven tools, support and community you need to create time for your life outside of medicine. We would love to see you there. Until next time. Thanks for listening.